Welcome to the Pragmatic Hero's Journey, a monthly podcast about becoming a pragmatic author, hosted by Tammy Corin and Tim Mitra. This episode was recorded on March 10, 2021. On this episode, Tammy and Tim talk with Brian Hogan about his journey to becoming a pragmatic author. The Pragmatic Heroes Journey is owned and operated by the Pragmatic Programmers LLC, home of the Pragmatic Bookshelf. Founded by Andy Hunt and Dave Thomas, the Pragmatic Programmers has one simple goal, to improve the lives of professional developers. So how are you? I am fantastic. I have a coffee right now. It is a very good coffee. Oh, what kind of coffee? Like, is it flavored or? It's it's a it's a local company that does their uh, that does roast some beans and they have a snickerdoodle coffee and it's really good. It's got a little hint of cinnamon in it. It's super good. So where where in the world do you find this coffee? Like, where's your local coffee come from? I'm in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. So there's a little shop here in town that's been here for like 25 years that they roast their own beans and they have a bunch of recipes and it's just really good stuff. So you're in the same time zone as Tammy, then I take it, right? Central. Tammy, you're in Central, right? I'm in Central. Yeah. Yeah. You go. We're in the cool time zone, Tim. Yeah, I'm in the I'm in the boring time zone. Anyway, so Brian, welcome to the show, which clearly is already recording. Yeah. <laughs> no surprise there, right? No, we know what you're gonna do. Yeah. So uh, let us uh, let us have you introduce yourself to our listeners. Let us uh, let it, let us know who you are and what you do. The, uh, the, the interesting thing is I've been, we've been talking a lot about like, what are, you know, what are biographies, what are, what are bios and all that. Cause I've been doing some work with uh, um, some people and we've been doing some mentoring and helping first time, uh, first time people, uh, you know, how do you, how do you position yourself? How do you market yourself? And so uh, I guess what I, what I'd say for myself, is I've, I've been going through the exercise with these people. And what I say is that, uh, you know, I'm a coder, an author, and I'm a teacher uh, and I develop software people and communities. So, you know, you, you bring up a good point, Brian, about how do you introduce yourself? And I was recently on a podcast and the podcast host was like, Hey, introduce yourself. And I was like, Oh, geez, I don't even know how to do that because how do you position yourself? What are you, what do you do? Are you what your job title is? And so you, well, so many people that I know just do so many different things. So I don't know. So Brian, I appreciate you mentioning that because really like how do you position yourself i thought you did a good job but at the same time that small introduction doesn't nearly scratch the surface of who i know you to be so i don't know where we go from there but welcome to the show thanks i mean it's one of those things you kind of take a little i used to have like a really long bio and i took inspiration from dave thomas when he said you know dave thomas is a programmer that that's what he shortened his bio to like that's a bit of an understatement, right? But but to be honest with to be honest, it's like you introduce yourself. People don't want people don't want to read all of that. They don't want to. What's your elevator pitch? Distill yourself down. And it's what I've been kind of coaching people to think about when it comes to that kind of stuff. Is just like, you know, your elevator pitch, your bio, your elevator pitch really is. You know, what what problems do you solve for people, and how? And it turns out that's a pretty nice template for people when you're trying to figure out how do I how do I write that LinkedIn bio or how do I write that author bio? How do I write, you know, if I'm going to be speaking somewhere and I want to ask me for a bio, you know, if you can distill that down to, you know, what problems do you solve for people and how do you do it? Turns out to be a pretty good formula. You do so many different things and you are so many different people to so many different people. How did you come to distill what you've done down to those few sentences that you have? about you you know how when you know how when you go on a job hunt and you've got like a lot of things on your resume but the job doesn't really care about all those things on your resume it, you sort of have to distill it down to what do you want to be known for like there's certain things that i know how to do that i don't actually want to do like i know how to write php but i don't like writing php and that's not a say that's not to say that php is isn't isn't a good thing because a lot of people like to crap on php and i don't think that's a nice thing to do I think it's a great language, but it's not the kind of work that I want to do full time. So I don't usually list that in my skills because uh, I've learned that if you tell people you can do something, they're going to make you do it eventually. Yeah. Um, just ask my know. mother-in-law. <laughs> yeah. So it's, a, it's like, it's like, I, I, um, if, if somebody, if somebody wants some PHP code written, 
what I'm going to do is say, you know what? I know several amazing people who know PHP and they are the best fit for this. I'm going to, I'm going to take five minutes. I'm going to make an introduction and, and they will help you. I'm not going to be that person. And so that's kind of what it is with this thing. It's like, there's a lot of things that I can do, but what do I want to do? What do I want to be known for? What problems do I want to solve? What am I interested in solving right now? And I'm, um, you know, I like, uh, I, I like writing code, but it turns out I'm not a big fan of writing code for other people for money. Um, I like writing code. I like open source, but I found like through the work that I've done in teaching and the work I've done in development editing, uh, work that I do now as a people manager, uh, I like developing people a lot more. Um, it, it was, it was really fun this week to, um, see a couple of people that I know go through the job hunt, the offer stage and get some accepted offers. Cause I, one of them was a student of mine from a long time ago. Uh, and, and this is, you know, it's, it's a, it's a big career move for her. Uh, another person that I know, um, just got an offer and is making, making the same kind of leap. And it's like, I can say I helped with that. I can go to a conference and I can see my former students or my mentees up on stage, or I can see them writing books or writing articles or contributing to things and, and doing some good in the world. And that to me feels a lot more fun than writing a crud app behind the firewall at some insurance company. It, people sort of see you in a certain way. And it's, I think it's hard to switch them away from that. Right. But uh, it's a good, it's a good point that you're making about presenting yourself and I'm thinking about my bios now that are out there, like, you know, how, how I'm presenting myself um, to the world. Um, so how do you, how do you steer people towards finding out what their unique skills are and, and, and promoting that? Well, there's, there's a couple of things. Um, you know, the first is I often advise people to sit down with a good, with a good, honest friend and ask them to take a stab at describing them. What do you, what do you know me for? What am I good at? You know, have, have some, have somebody who's not you take a stab at giving you that kind of, that kind of feedback. You don't, you don't need to ask them what you're terrible at, but you want to say, when you, when you think about me, what are the top three or four things that come to mind that, that, you know, if you were going to recommend me for a job, or if you were going to, you know, recommend me for a, a, you know, a, a, a volunteer project, what are those adjectives that describe me? Uh, and you, you do that enough and you can get some people to help you. There's this, concept that I learned about uh, from um, a former manager, Tim Falls, called the Jahari window. And it's this idea that there are things that there are things that only you know about yourself and you haven't shared them with other folks. And then there are things that other people know about you that you have let them know about you, the, 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 the things that you both know about yourself. And then there's stuff that other people know about you that you don't know. And the idea is that the more you can open that window, the more you can you know, increase that, that window, uh, you know, the better sense, the better idea about yourself that you'll have. So that's one way is just, you know, ask your, ask your, your trusted, honest friends to do that. I've, I've even suggested, Hey, have somebody else write your, write your first draft of your bio, have them do it. Cause it's hard to write our own, but have somebody else take a stab at it for you. Can convince them, you know, pay them, bribe them, whatever you got to do to get them to buy their time to do it. But it can be helpful. But the other thing is, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to think about your software career or any kind of professional career more holistically and consider yourself as a product. So a lot of it comes back to looking at marketing. How do you market something? How do you market an app? How do you market a product? Well, what can you apply to yourself? How can you market you? It turns out there's an awful lot of books and resources on there that will give you a nice high level view of marketing. And so that what it comes back to is what problem do you solve for people, right? People, um, have you ever heard the expression that, you know, people want, people want holes, not drills, you know, they want the solution to the yes. problem, right? Yep. So what, what problems do you solve for people becomes a good way to, to kick that discussion off. And then, then you can start building your brand, you, your own personal brand from there. I'm the person that makes iOS games. That's the thing that I do. Um, there's other things that I could do, but this is the thing that I do. Or I teach people to make iOS games through my books, my videos, my writing. That, that's, the, that's, that just, there's other things that you can do, sure. What do you want to do right now? And, and maybe in a couple of years, you might want to rebrand yourself. And I think that's okay too. It's funny that you mentioned having other people write your bio or 
you know, basically take a look at who you are or what solutions you're providing for them. Because quite honestly, the best bios I have ever heard about myself are the ones that have been given by other people. Well, one of the things though, that's, I think, you know, we know, uh, we know as editors is that um, the, the, the process, any process goes better and faster with feedback. And the more you open yourself up to feedback from other people, the more you, the more you make it less weird and awkward to give and receive feedback the better you can become. So putting yourself out there and asking your friends, look, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a new job uh, or I'm looking at this new opportunity. Uh, tell me how I can, tell me how you think I can position myself. Where, and you know, where are the opportunities for me? Where are the opportunities for me to improve? If you want to ask those questions, ask those questions. See if you can get people to give them to you. You'd be surprised uh, the more trust that you have with people, the more honest feedback you can get, but it's a gift and uh, it, it helps, it helps you see where you should put your time and it helps you get a better picture again of, of who you are and what you, what you can do. So how did you get involved with this whole idea of helping people be better at the things that they want to be better at? Like, where did that start? Was it always something that you had growing up or did you just sort of fall into it? I'm, I'm curious, like, when did that start for you, that, that drive to help other people? It was always there from as long as I can remember. I would, um, when I was, a, when I was a kid, I would learn something and I would show it to somebody else. And my parents were teachers. So that probably had something to do with it. Um, but it, I, I wanted to, I, I believed at the time that I wanted to, you know, be a, be a, uh, a software developer. I wanted to be a web developer. I liked it a lot. I, I did a lot of that stuff when the, when the web was first becoming a thing, I really dove into it with, you know, head first. Um, and I went to college and I said, I don't think I want to go do computer science. I took some computer science courses and I was like, this, this isn't for me. This, this kind of, this isn't fun. I don't think I like this so much, but I'm building, I'm building web things for people. My, my, my dad had taught me how to program when I was in fourth grade. So I kind of, I knew how to write code a lot. And so the classes were, you know, I, I wasn't really into the theory at the time. I was more in the, into the, let's, let's do things. Let's, let's create, let's deliver. I, again, I, I'm in that same camp. I don't really care about the drills. I want the holes. Um, and and so I thought, well, what I'm not doing very well, I'm, 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 doing, I'm doing pretty well at making web sites and web applications. What I'm not doing very well is getting paid for it. Um, I'm not finding work in the right ways. So maybe what I should do is I should go to school for business. Maybe I should learn how to do the business side of things. Uh, and so that's, that's why I changed my major and then graduated and got a job as a software developer. So... <laughs> uh, and and so I kind of did that for a while and I had a program that uh, we started up where we had some uh, interns and um, the interns would come interns would come work for me we'd, they, we'd build some production applications and they would tell me that they're learning more in that environment than they were learning in the classes uh, and so with their gentle you know cajoling they convinced me to like you know you, you know write more teach more do more things so uh, you know I, I i wrote some blog posts um those turned into opportunities to write books uh with with pride prog um that turned into opportunity to edit because i'm like you know what I, I like helping people this is looks this looks like it aligns with my interest let me help people get their books published now that they know how to do it from the author's side of things let me help people do that way and then and then that led to a full-time teaching post where I was teaching software development. Um, and, and it was an opportunity for me to say, like, I can do this the right way. There are people here. Uh, I can do this the way that I think it should be done. Let's focus on the solutions. And then when it's time, when it's necessary, then we can dive deeper into the theory, the data structures, the algorithms, the things that we, we, can, we can turn it on its head a little bit. And, and that turned to be very effective. You know, there are students um, that I... There were students that I knew that didn't even own a computer and they were in my class. They were working at the public library getting their homework done there. Um, I had a student who lived in his car 
for a, a semester. And, you know, now he's uh, got a nice six figure salary as a software engineer. Um, th- those are, those are the things that I look back very fondly. And that's where it just like, I can help people through other people. The more people you help, the more those people can then help other people. And it, you know, it's that paying it forward idea. So, you know, if I help, if I help a student get a job as a, you know, as a manager or a director somewhere, and they can build out a team and then I can say, you know what, I have a connection at this place. That person might be able to help you do that. And it actually happened. Uh, one of my a long time ago, former students met one of my current students at the time and they started just playing chess together and they built a good relationship. And then they, and then one of them wanted to go work for the other one. Uh, that's kind of how it happened for me, but it, it's all guided by the idea that it, we can help each other out. A lot of people helped me. I had a lot of doors opened for me and, uh, and I'm always very happy to do that for other people. So how do you, how do you handle like thing like, like the whole job search process for, for, especially for new, new people, new students who are getting out of the work world. I mean, you know, there's a lot, as you know, there's a, you send out a lot of resumes and you get a lot of rejections or sometimes you don't even get a response. How do you, how do you coach somebody through the sort of acceptance of that's the way it is and, and, you know, till they get that door held open for them by somebody? Well, I think, um, I, I it's, it's funny because Corey Quinn was talking about this on Twitter uh, a couple weeks ago and it's exactly what I've been thinking for a long time. It's the idea that, the front door, uh, the applications, that, that's that's not effective. There are, the last time I hired for a position, and it wasn't even a junior level position, the last time I hired for a position, I had 250 applicants for it. I mean, that's that's 249 people who are going to get no's, right? Um, so, how, you know, how, how do you, how do you as a newbie circumvent that? Well, you, 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 you try to use the, you try to have a network. And I'm, I'm big on networks. I'm big on, and, and not, not, not using a network just so you can get something out of it. I mean, a real, a real genuine network where you can help one another. Um, not just, not just so it's there when you need it, but so that it's always there so you can mutually help each other. And so, you know, there are programs out there. Um, there's one that, one that I've recently become uh, a, a part of that I'm, I'm, I think is a really wonderful opportunity. It's called the Collab Lab. They, they help junior developers uh, get some real world experience by working on a project. It's, you know, they, it's a, it's a, uh, they work on a project with mentors. They get paired up with mentors and these mentors can, you know, they can help them work on a project as a team. Uh, it's a nice program to get into once you've finished a boot camp, for example. And it, it, get, it gets that one step beyond, but what it really provides is it provides mentorship. And then, you know, perhaps those mentors can then help you with their connections and say, maybe I can find you a job somewhere. Or, you know, I know somebody, or I saw some Twitter post, or here's a position that might be a good fit for you. I think that's kind of how it works. A lot of times people know that positions are opening up well before they're posted. If you happen to have, you know, a network, you know, like for anybody who's who, anybody who I'm mentoring, if I happen to see a position come across my timeline or through the grapevine or through my network, first thing I want to do is say, Hey, y'all, there's, here's a job, go apply for it. You know, need to recommend if I, if I have to know the person, maybe I can make a recommendation. Maybe I can do a referral, but I think that's kind of the, the key is figure out a way to connect with people. Uh, and try to circumvent that 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 front door process, and I think that it's it's more doable now. I see a lot of people who are new to the industry doing it through content. They'll learn about things, they'll create a blog, or they'll uh, do some videos, and they'll promote themselves on social media, uh, and and they'll they'll develop and cultivate an audience that way. It's it's not easy work, but it's it's doable work. Other people have managed to do it through open source contributions, but I think, I think what's the the other part of this is that I think people who are in more senior positions, uh, people who are in management positions, people who are in director positions, I think you have to meet people halfway. I think you need to be pushing to create more junior level positions at companies, 
um, you know, create more opportunities. I think software engineers need to, you know, make mentoring part of what they do uh, to, to kind of balance things out. It shouldn't all fall on the new graduate from a boot camp or a tech college or a university to figure it out on their own. It, everybody in the industry, you know, we shouldn't just pull the ladders up after ourselves once we get what we want. So how do you go from developer or software engineer or even mentor to book author? Like, I'm sure we have a lot of our listeners are wondering, yeah, I'm, I really want to help people and I have all this knowledge and how do I go about sharing that with somebody? Maybe you could clue us in as to how you got started being an author at the Pragmatic Bookshelf. Well, I got started because somebody took a chance on me. Um, I have written a blog, a couple of blog posts. Uh, we had managed to get, uh, we managed to solve a problem uh, at the place that I worked. And I wrote some blog posts about it because I figured other people were having the same kind of problem. And turns out they were. And uh, Bruce Tate from um, you know, Elixir fame and all that, he, he, uh, he reached out to me and said, Can, you should write a chapter for this upcoming book. Uh, on on this topic and I did and that was like that was very cool but again it was I had written some stuff on my personal blog and it just happened to solve the problem it happened to get picked up on uh, some of the social sites at the time I've written a lot of other stuff that nobody's ever read so uh, it, it, it happens to be a lot of a, a lot of luck I'm not going to tell people that you can just work really hard and things will happen. It, it's a combination of working really hard uh, and having the right people notice it at the right time and then extend their hand to you and say, join us. However, there's no easier time right now to be a content creator. If you know something, there are multiple avenues for, uh, for, getting, uh, for getting your information out there and getting compensated for it. You can, you can self-publish a book you can pitch your idea to a publisher. You can you can write an article, and there are numerous numerous sites out there that will pay for technical content. Uh, there's there's so many places that you can get started now that uh, you know making it uh, making it a habit. But I think if you think about what I was saying about the bios, it again comes back to that. What do people need to know? I think a lot of people go wrong because they, they say, I am excited about this topic. I think this thing is really neat. And they don't take the time to make the case for why someone else should think it's neat. Why someone else should care. Again, people want solutions. They want holes, not drills. Go might be an excellent programming language, but why should I invest my time as a busy adult with family, kids, community obligations, and many other things going on. Why should I invest my time in this as opposed to continuing forward with the thing that I'm currently doing? I think that's the important case. We, in, in education, we talk about the idea of instructor focus versus student focus. Um, we've all probably had the, the teacher at one point who stands up in front and just talks about, you know, I did this, I did that, and, and just kind of the the giver of the information and none of it really seems aligned or interesting or targeted at what the students need to know. And we've probably also all had situations where we've listened to a bunch of lectures and then had a test where there was, you know, stuff on the test we'd never heard about in lecture. The, 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 the real thing to do to get noticed, to get, uh, to get picked up is to hone in on the kinds of problems people in your particular development community are having and then strive to address those. Attack the problem. The technology that you love is the vehicle for solving that problem. It is the method that you use, but it's not, it's not the star of the show. The person's problem, the learner's problem is the star of the show. And the more you take the emphasis off you and put it towards them and the thing that they want to do, the quicker the pickup will be. And you'll eventually become known as the person who teaches people to solve a problem using this technology. If you think about people like uh, Wes Boss and Corey House uh, and, and other just very prolific teachers, 
that's what their content does. It's very focused on solving a very specific problem with a specific technology. So let me ask you a question then. If, I don't know how to phrase this. Let's say you're, you're really passionate about a topic or there's something that you really want to teach people because you enjoy this thing, this technology, or you've had a lot of luck with it, a lot of success with it. But let's just say that it's sort of more of a hobby, for example. You know, it's it, you don't expect to make a lot of money doing this thing, but it's fun to learn. Okay. Mm -hmm. How would you fit that into being able to say, hey, here's this this thing? I know you're a busy adult and I know that you got other things going on, but hey, here's this thing that's really cool that might take your mind off of some of the more stressful things that you're doing in life. Like, how would you position that to somebody and, and make it something that they'd be like, Oh yeah, that sounds really cool to get away from stuff. And Hey, maybe I can make some money out of it, or maybe I can just take a break from life. Like, is that something that, that people who want to write on, on topics should even consider, or is that like, well, maybe do that another time. I think it's something to consider. Um, you know, you think about the, the, there's a couple of pragmatic programmer books. We've got uh, the, the Mazes for Programmers book and the Ray Tracer Challenge book. Those are those are books that, um, you know, they're targeted at someone who's, here's, here's, here's some challenging things, but it's not, you're not going to use this in your day job, but it will help you. It will help you become a better programmer. And you can kind of position it that way. Like what really is the benefit of doing this? Maybe it is just, it's fun. And there's a lot of places for things that are fun. But it is also it is changing the uh, changing the focus. It's it's not. I think it's neat. That's 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 where you run into problems convincing someone. I think this is neat. Show them why they would think it's interesting. So two of the most recent books that you did with the Pragmatic Bookshelf are Build Websites with Hugo and Small Sharp Software Tools. And we're talking about, you know, getting people excited about different technologies that that the that you might be interested in and how they can use it to to do whatever they want to do. What was the driving force for you to come up with, you know, the the ideas behind build websites with Hugo and Small Sharp software tools? Well, Small Sharp Software Tools came out of curriculum that I developed out of a class that I was teaching. Before we, before we threw everybody into the wild with um, learning to program, we got them comfortable on Windows machines and Macs and, uh, and Linux environments. And what I, what I thought would be an interesting, uh, it was an interesting hypothesis at the time, and it turned out to be fairly useful teaching them command line tools and command line commands as a first step. And then a second step, teaching them to put those commands together into the pipelines. And then as a third step, teaching them to use those same commands in scripts and sort of teaching them programming by sort of learning to program or automate your operating system. Because you can teach the fundamentals of programming with you know, putting the statements in the right order, thinking about the sequence of things. It, it's it's a it's kind of an on ramp to that, and the, the more I taught the class, the more I discovered you know there's actually quite a bit here that we could expand upon and say, actually there there are a lot of solutions, there are a lot of problems that we can solve for people. This this is a tool you can use to solve this particular problem. So if you look at small sharp software tools, it's broken down by uh, you know by by areas like you know work, running running programs or um, working with a shell or working with streams of text. It's all very focused on here's here are specific problems that you're going to encounter. Here are some tools you can use to handle those kinds of problems. So it was it was always like, what's the problem first, and now let's think about the tooling. So that's that's how that kind of came about. Um, and I was always frustrated when I was working on another book, like I was working on my Tmux book, and I was working as an editor on a couple of other books, and we always had to. We always had to kick people over to another book about learning command line because there'd be whether it would be a Ruby book or a notebook or something, we'd always have to say, you know, you're going to open a terminal and you're going to navigate to some directories and you types of commands. We never had a good, I never had a good book that I liked that I could kick people over to and say, read this first if you need to get up to speed with the command line. So it was sort of solving two problems at once. 
the Hugo book was um, was a direct result of me feeling there was a need for an intermediate space between you've learned HTML and CSS uh, to then, well, what's, what's next? Do you go to WordPress or do you, you know, do you build a database based, based application? What, what's that middle step? And static site generators were the next middle step because when you, when you make a, when you make a website and you have more than one page, you're going to find yourself cutting and pasting or copying and pasting the navigation bar and the, the overall template. So there's lots of tools out there that can help you get around that. Gatsby JS and 11D and a bunch of other static site generators will help you get over that by letting you make templates and letting you do theming. And they're not, they're not database driven so that you get, they get fast and they generate a static website, which we, which is a solved problem. We know how to solve, we know how to serve static websites quickly. And so it was like, well, I want to definitely do something related to static websites. That was my, you know, my idea for my next book. But what is, what, what is the thing that will solve the problem uh, in, the more, in the more quick and compact way? And so I spent a, a year working on a couple of site migrations. I was getting a, a few uh, side projects and clients of mine off of WordPress because of security and they weren't up, they weren't updating their sites frequently at all. Um, and so it was, we figured we could do it with like a headless CMS or something. They didn't need to have all the security vulnerabilities that WordPress was, was creating for them. Um, so let's get them off of those. And so we did that and I did a few migrations. And as I did them, I, I discovered that Hugo was the tool that required the least amount of setup. I, I didn't need anything other than the Hugo binary. I didn't need any other dependencies to do uh, image opt or image resizing or uh, SAS to CSS conversion. I didn't need anything. And it was really fast. So after doing a couple of uh, migrations, I was thinking to myself, this is, this is the next step. Once you know HTML and CSS, the next step is, is, is Hugo, in my opinion. So I came at it from a very opinionated standpoint. You could, you could learn all these JavaScript libraries. You could learn React, which is what, which is what Gatsby wants you to do, learn React. Or uh, you could use Hugo, which requires you to learn a little, bit of, a little bit of Go templating, but it's not really Go templating because most of it you can copy and paste out of the documentation. Um, but most of the code you'll write is marked down for the, for the content and regular HTML for the rest of your site. That's a lot smaller of a learning curve than say, go learn JavaScript and, or go learn Ruby to use Jekyll or you know, go, learn all, go, go learn all these other languages. Um, it was, again, thinking about how can we get people to uh, a finished product? How can we get people, how can, how can you launch your, uh, your idea as quickly as possible? So that's how they came about. You mentioned, writing Markdown and, and making things easier for the web. So that, of course, made my brain go off on this whole thing about the whole writing process and the editing process and, and sort of, I kind of wanted to dip into your brain about how you go about writing books and even writing, forgetting books even, just writing content in general. Like what tools do you use? And how do you, do you start with the code first and then write the explanation around the code? Because I know that we have a lot of listeners that are probably thinking, I don't even know where to start. Forget about writing a book. I don't even know where to start with writing a blog post. So I want to dip into your brain right now and find out how you approach. Just let's even start with a single topic. You know, is it the code first and then the writing or the idea? Can you just sort of lay it out for us? Yeah. So right now, uh, I have uh, I have the start of an article that I'm hoping to publish, and it's it's a, a really short. I'm hoping for it to be a really short article. If it's not, I'll have to cut some stuff out. The idea is that it's going to be an article on command line tools, but very very specific solutions. Here are some common tasks that I've I've been finding myself doing, um, and I, I I if I find myself doing things over and over again, I I realize that there's probably some other people that are doing the same thing. So let, let me share that information. 
And so I have, I have about a handful, maybe five or six different commands that I've been using over and over again to solve very specific problems. And so what I did was I wrote them down. I just wrote them down in this list and I started writing around them. And that's typically what I do. I typically do the technical stuff first, get the code examples in place um, and, and work backwards. I'm, I'm very competency driven. So what is the outcome that I want someone to have? Well, I want them to have, what is the new skill I want them to have? Or what is the new thing I want them to be able to do? And then I, I work backwards from there. Like, okay, what do I need to teach them to help them get there? But in most cases, it is, you know, writing out the text uh, comes later, writing out the commands and uh, the steps that happens first. A lot of times I tend to take notes as I do things. Uh, I do new things. I tend to just take notes to help me cement the knowledge. And then I often can turn those notes into an article or a piece of content. Uh, so, but I, I am one of those people that writes the tech, the, the tech first and then the text second. That, that's been my strategy. But it usually does start with something something is irritating me or something I, I, this, this, I think people would find this useful. And a lot of times I'm wrong. I think that one of the things that, uh, one of the things that was kind of drilled into me at an early age when it comes to producing content is that it is like every other job. It's not something that you can just sit around and wait for the muse to strike. You need to be producing content all the time. It's just like coding. If you imagine being a software engineer, could you imagine telling your manager, yeah, you know, I, don't, I just don't feel productive today. I don't know. I'm not going to write code today. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. And it doesn't really work with content either because you have to put out a lot of clunkers uh, before you get something really good. That's been my experience. It's been the experience that I've seen with a lot of other authors too, is that there's lots of hits and there's lots of misses before you get the hits. And so what, what I tell people a lot is write all the time, every day. When I'm not doing tech stuff, I, I write music. I produce music. I love music. Music is like my second life. I have thousands of compositions that no one is ever going to hear because they're garbage. Um, but I still do. I still write. Every day I'm writing or recording something. It's part of the, pro it's part of the process. And eventually something good is going to come from this. And uh, Seth Godin has a book out and it's called The Practice. And it's a very good book that, that talks about this exact same thing. It, it, to, to create content, it needs to be part of what you do. It's, it's part of the process. I wouldn't say you have to spend like eight hours a day doing it, but you know, write every day. If you write every day and publish it to a blog that nobody reads, you've still got at the end of the year, 365 posts that's on a blog on the internet that someone's going to eventually see, whether it's for you or a potential hiring manager or whatever, someone will see that and they will get value from that. So do it a lot. And like every other skill, the more you do it, the better you get at it. So cool. when I'm sorry, Tim, go ahead. Well, I was going to divert the show into where it was supposed to go, but ask your question. I do. I have another question. I was, I was wondering if you approach blog content or short form content differently than you approach book length content. So I think it's kind of important to know if you, if you sort of approach those differently or the same or what. I don't usually think of them as different. Uh, a short form content, a short form thing could just be a chapter of book. Um, I think of them more as, I think of them more as what are they, what, again, what are they trying to solve? Who's my audience? What do they want to hear? What do they need to hear? What do I think they need to hear? What do I want, what do I want them to get better at? Uh, and if it happens to end up only being a piece of short form content, then it ends up on a blog. If it happens to be super short, maybe it ends up as a Twitter thread, um, but it's still content. And how can I, re, you know, how can I repurpose that content? How can I use it differently? I don't tend to think of it any differently, though. The structure is usually the same. What are we going to get out of this? What will I be able to do that I couldn't do before? Even if that doing is just understanding something, it's still a new skill or something that someone can add. Why are they, why are they reading this thing? Maybe my, maybe my goal is that I, I want to inspire people with my poetry. That's a fine goal. And so I'll sit down and write a poem. I'm not a poet, but I know that there are people are. I have a, I have a person that I work with. Uh, he's very good. 
uh, very good. He, he writes very, very nice poetry. And that's his motivation. I want to inspire people in the world with my poems. That's very cool to me. And you know, he's not thinking about writing like a book of poetry. He's just thinking, I'm going to write poems. What happens with that when he's got a hundred of them? Maybe he does pick 50 of them out and put them in an anthology or something. Maybe he does that. But I, you know, when it comes to the writing that I do, no, I'm not really thinking about, I'm not really thinking about it in terms of, is this going to be for a book or is this going to be for an individual article? I am mostly focused on what is, what am I trying to accomplish with this writing? And then what does it look like when I'm done with it? Am I done with it just after four, four paragraphs? Yeah, I'm done. Uh, the, the Hugo book actually came out of a conference talk. The first chapter of that book is actually a conference talk that I was giving at the time. And I realized, wow, that I could actually go a lot deeper than this. There's so many things that I could do that goes beyond this. Um, so, you know, write some stuff and see where it takes you. That's kind of my philosophy. So I had a really good segue, but, you know, of course, Tammy interrupted with the last question. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I like to keep you on your toes, Tim. All right. So speaking of hits and misses, we have this new part of the show <laughs> that we can go to. <laughs> that kind of works. Anyway. I got to use it anyway. Um, you may remember from Roundabout that we, we used to have these crazy chaos questions and, and we don't have that. We haven't, we're not quite as evolved yet. So we, we're still working on it. It's a work in progress. Um, and I was editing the, uh, the questions just a little, few minutes ago. But so if you're ready, we can dive in with these um, hero's journey questions. Oh, this is, this is like the hot seat. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the hero's journey hot seat. Wait a second. Hot seat. Wow, oh, look at that. Okay, <laughs> we're renaming it called the hot seat questions. All right. It's now, it's now written in text on my note, notepad. <laughs> it's carved in text. Engrave it on uh, the back of the iPhone. It's yeah, somewhere exactly. in Trello. We're fine. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it's funny. I've always, I've often wondered, you meet somebody famous these days. What do you do? Get them to sign your phone, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I was at WWDC a couple of, like back in 2010 or whatever. I met Bill Atkinson and had him sign my, my badge. You did yeah. not. I did. So anywho. Um, so here's the questions. Who are your influencers? Influences? Who are your influences? Hmm. I rewrote that one. It needs work. Yeah, it really does, Tim. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> that is not the way I wrote that. Only question. there were two editors on the show with me. You know, I, if only if only I had seen the questions before I asked. <laughs> no, see, Tim, the question should be, who has like, influenced didn't like the you the most? Why? Oh, well, why no, the, like the way you had written it before was was horrid. So I I, I oh, changed it to who are you, who weird. are who are your influences? Who are your influencers? I didn't approve that question. What? What? Yeah, <laughs> you wrote the question. I'm sorry. Let him answer it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've had a few, uh, and and I've had a few people that I I think have been very very influential in my career. I'm 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 always going to call out Bruce Tate for being very influential. Um, he he's the person that. Uh, turned me on to the Ruby programming language when I was kind of thinking that maybe software development wasn't a thing I wanted to do anymore. Um, and so I, I, a lot of where I'm at right now is as a result of him. Uh, there is a, a, uh, a wonderful, wonderful woman named Deb Walsh, who was my, uh, I would say she's my teaching mentor. I learned a lot about how adults learn, how the brain works, how we absorb information uh, from her uh, spending many hours in her office, picking her brain, uh, being in her classes, learning how to be a better educator. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Dave Thomas and Andy Hunt have always been, you know, uh, very kind and generous with their time and uh, their, their thoughts and sharing them with me and guiding me in the right direction. So, um, but, you know, the, uh, the other person who, uh, is the teacher that I aspire to be is Daniel Steinberg, who's written a whole bunch of iOS stuff. He's, uh, he's, he's the teacher that I, I, I want to be someday. Um, he, if you, if you ever have the opportunity to be in one of his classes, he is, he's one of the people that you would call a master instructor, a master instructor. Yeah. I'll second that for sure. All right. Next question. Um, okay. This is sort of the favorite color question, but 
it, we've, we've changed it for this purpose. So what do you like most about your favorite programming language? Well, what do I like most about my favorite? Pro- I like, oh, so I like Ruby and I, what I like about it the most is that for some reason it works really well with my brain. So this is a very, I, I, this is not something that I can explain as to other people why they should use it. But for me, it works really well with my brain. I can almost, from the very first day I used it, I can almost guess what I needed to do. Um, the, the, the standard library, the, the, the built-in methods on things, they always, they, it always seemed to behave exactly as I expected, which is part of the language's design. But that's what I like about it the most. I, I, from the very first day I used it, I was immensely productive. Now, I'm not even talking about Ruby on Rails here. I'm talking about literally the Ruby programming language. For some reason, it just clicks for me. And I am, I, I am able to solve fairly difficult problems with it in a fraction of the time. I don't know why that is, but it is my favorite thing about the language. So what's your favorite text editor or IDE and why? Um, the answer is Vim um, because, uh, because a number of reasons. No, the, 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 the first reason is that I know it so well that I can customize it uh, to do exactly what I need to do without relying on anybody else. I don't have to rely on a company to release a feature. I don't have to rely on um, uh, you know, someone else to write a, a lexer or parser for a new programming language. I know it well enough that, that I can customize it to meet my needs, whether I'm writing a book. So all my books are written in Vim. All of my articles are written in Vim. All of my all of my reports, my status updates, my uh, I write everything in Vim, every single thing, because I've had, you know, I've I've filled in things on websites before, and then had the screen like log me out or whatever, and I lost my text. So I write every single thing in Vim, and then copy and paste it into something else. Um, it's every all the all the commands to me are second nature, and so you know I'm not going to tell everybody they should learn Vim, but I'm going to say you should probably give it a try. But the real message here is learn a text editor and learn it really well so that you can customize it and control what you need to do so that you can solve problems quickly without relying on other people to do it. You wanna learn that new cool programming language? How easy is it for you to wire the programming languages runtimes or whatever into your environment so you can hit a keystroke and have your programs run? That's important. All right, I'll remember that next time somebody bugs me about using Ed. Um, So if you could choose another profession, what would it be? I'm already doing like three jobs. Um, I would love to just be able to be financially stable enough to just write music all day. That'd be great, you know? Yeah. That'd be be it for me. I just said this, you know, I'd like to go sit outside in the park and play guitar, or I'd like to, you know, compose a film score. I'd like to just be able to do that. Um, And, so that's always kind of my go-to answer. Cool. All right. I'm seeing a pattern here where most developers are also musicians. Are you seeing or, this or same artists. pattern? Or well, artists. yeah, but I mean, that sort of falls under the same umbrella, no? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've always said that coding is creative, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Um, this is the this or that hot seat. Um, so we'll just dig in. Work alone or work with a team? Or with the team. If we swing back around to one of the things that I talked about at the very beginning of this, it was the importance of feedback. Mm, good point. You don't get better without feedback. Chad Fowler in The Passionate Programmer says, be the worst person in the band. How are you <laughs> going to how are you gonna grow if you don't have people around you pushing you, giving you feedback, you know, to get to get better? You know, you need other people around you. Absolutely correct. That's right up there with never be the smartest person in the room. Right. Yeah. See, the why really? is important, Tim, to say in. <laughs> All, right. All right. Okay. Book or ebook and why? <laughs> See, I already trained him. <laughs> well, uh, e- ebook because. I don't see very well, so I can make it whatever size I want without it. I'll get a large text exactly. version. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I've noticed ever since I started wearing glasses about 10 years ago, I, I, 
I don't pick up books as much as I used to. That's right. It's the dynamic type. Yes. Form or function and why? Oh, function. I, I do not care how well something looks if it doesn't work at all. I've had enough of that. Um, <laughs> I've, I've seen some, some, uh, some pretty nice looking things that don't work at all or, you know, die. And I was just talking with somebody about this the other day. Um, the first set of appliances I bought for my first house, they lasted 10 years. The next appliances I bought barely made it too. Um, I think that you have to look at how things work, not what they look like. And I think that's the same thing for programming languages. I think, um, you know, there are, I, I am, I, I love the idea that there are some programming languages that you can do everything in. I like the idea, the theory that you can do full stack development using just JavaScript. But I think that if you're, if you're thinking, you know, how do I do it the, you know, most effective way, there might be other languages that you might want to substitute for different parts of that stack. You, you might end up with a, you know, you might end up with a better iOS app if you write it in Swift as opposed to writing it in React Native. You might end up with something better there. You might have a better experience for your end users if you learn Go to build command line app as opposed to trying to do it in Node or Python. There are, um, there are lots of things to think about, lots of trade-offs there, but I will always shoot for what's the best tool for the job, even if it's not the prettiest tool. I, I, want, I want the best tool for the job. What a great segue to the next question. Yeah, but also on a side note, now I completely understand that question. She doesn't Last... understand what a segue is. I'm no, <laughs> no, I understand what a segue is. I just did, when we first asked that question the first two times in the first two shows, I was like, what is this question even about? But now I get it. Did I ruin your segue? Because that was my plan. <laughs> well, a lot of, um, it's ruined now. I can't, you know, can't, <laughs> can't bring it back. Woo-hoo. All right. So pen or pencil and why oh pen they glide better on paper that's the first reason it's just to feel better and if i make a mistake they give a new piece of paper scratch it out whatever okay last question this is the fisticuff fisticuff question so far oh boy star wars or star trek no star wars too easy no you answered it too fast what (laughs) yeah because it's star wars because you know, you know why the Empire Strikes Back is my favorite movie. It's not even like my favorite Star Wars movie. It's my favorite movie. I watch it when I'm sick. I watch it when Ooh. I just don't feel good. Out of all movies, for some reason, that movie gives me great comfort. I just enjoy it. It's like give me, give me my blanket. I'm having a bad day. Had a bad day. Give me my blanket. I'm gonna lay on the couch. I'm gonna watch The Empire Strikes Back. Why that movie? Uh, it was my mom's favorite movie. When I was a little, when I was little, we'd watch it together. Um, I have a copy of a book on my shelf uh, that she had, that she owned. Uh, it is the uh, it is the script for Empire Strikes Back with a bunch of illustrations. Nice. It is a very cool, uh, very cool book that she had in her collection, and I I now I now have it. Um, but it was her it was her favorite movie, and I remember that she bought when I was very very young. She bought a VCR. Uh, and this was when movies were like eighty dollars for a VHS tape. You know, they, they, they weren't they weren't cheap yet. Um, but she bought a VCR, uh, and she got she got to pick a movie with it. And of course, she picked The Empire Strikes Back. So, like for a little while, the only video we had for the V for the you know for the VCR was The Empire Strikes Back. You know, whatever else she taped off a of TV or whatever she rented, but we had that we owned that movie, and so it was always on. Nice. See that, Tim, there's always a deeper reason for an answer. Oh, yeah. Well, Brian, I am so glad that you joined us today or tonight, or I don't even know what. Well, I guess you're in my time zone, right? So it's tonight now. It's dark out. It's dark out. Yeah. And I'm thinking (laughs) to myself, I'm like, oh, gosh, I got to go give my dog medicine in the dark. And I'm like, oof, but okay, that's all right. Um, But I, I so enjoyed our conversation. And thank you for joining Tim and I on the show tonight and telling us all about your journey to becoming a pragmatic author. So I appreciate that. And thank you. You're very welcome. This is a lot of fun.
Thanks for thanks for inviting me on. You're welcome. Now, Tim, it's your turn to actually do the you outro. You want me to that do the wrap par- up now? I do. I mean, you're so good at it. Okay. Well, I'm, I, you still haven't given me the proper script, so I'm, I've I've been was editing it during the show. So oh, here we lovely! Go. I can't wait to hear it. Here we go. We, we're going to have some stops and starts as well. That wraps up another episode of the Pragmatic Heroes Journey podcast. You can find us on the web at pragprog.com. We're also on Twitter and Facebook as Pragprog. Prag okay. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, if you enjoy the podcast, please consider writing a review on iTunes, sharing a link on social media. Um, I don't know about where do they send us feedback, Tammy? Uh, they could send us feedback at pragtalk at pragprog.com. And of course, if you are looking to write your own book, send us a message. You can find out more information on, on pragprog.com. There's a little link down at the bottom that says becoming a pragmatic author. We would love to hear your ideas. And maybe one day, you know, maybe guest number 10 or 50, we'll see. Tim and I will actually have a real honest to God um, wrap up for this show. But until <laughs> then, you get to hear us struggle along like the rest of us. Until until next time, folks. Of course, you can send us your feedback, too. Oh, yeah, you could if I knew the email. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think I just gave, didn't I? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, that is it for us tonight, folks. We will see you, or hopefully, you will hear from us next time. Thanks for listening to the Pragmatic Hero's Journey. We hope you enjoyed the show. For more information about the Pragmatic Hero's Journey, please visit pragprop.com or send an email to pragtalk at pragprop.org. Your hero's journey has just begun.